Mike Kenvians, Papa Ken here, and welcome to a brand new episode of Discovering Game of Thrones. Let's get right into it with The King's Road, and we'll begin with my favorite parts of this episode, of which there are quite a few. Um, to begin with, and, and this... Uh, I wrote this particular character down, even though they weren't really there a lot in the episode, and uh, I apologize if I say the name wrong, but Ser Jora Mormont. Um, uh, basically, he's sort of... He, he, he seems to be the one non-Dothraki other than the uh, uh, Targaryens that are with the Dothraki. <laughs> Um, and, and he seems very honorable, just like the way he is with Daenerys, and uh, he, he just he seemed like a very kind person, um, undoubtedly someone who underneath that kind exterior will slaughter someone <laughs> without a second thought, but at the same time it's just I, I like the fact that there is that warm, well not necessarily warm, but that kind figure there among uh, this crowd, not to say that none of the Dothraki are kind, I mean, that's, that seems a little bit uh, 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 offensive of me to say, but just it seems like that one person that is able to help um, Daenerys feel more comfortable before what comes later in the episode, which I'll get to. <laughs> but moving on, my second favorite part of this episode is just the simple scene of Tyrion waking up in, I guess it was a barn, but waking up with all the dogs very much hungover. <laughs> and then immediately after slapping Joffrey. <laughs> now, I, I know people hate Joffrey. I, just from this episode alone, I hate Joffrey. I can only assume he gets worse. But, yeah, um, just the way he slapped Joffrey around was so strangely cathartic in a way. Because I was having a very stressful day when I watched this. <laughs> but, yeah, that was, that was a wonderful little segment for this episode. Um, moving on, my next favorite part of this episode was something I didn't expect. Um, we get to see Cersei's other kids. Um, I, as, to the best of my knowledge, I thought she only had Joffrey because, again, this could be just a thing of me not fully paying attention or me missing certain things, but when they arrived, I don't remember these kids being there. I don't remember these kids being there in any other scene. So the fact that these kids who, again, I, I don't know their name. Did I write them down? No, I didn't write their names down. Probably should have. <laughs> but... I just I, I found that to be rather interesting, and then um, when Cersei goes to visit Cat, talking about her firstborn who had died, it th that was a really powerful moment, in my opinion. I I don't know, again, because it's obvious that probably everyone is going to be playing mind games um, through this series, uh, in addition in addition to games where people get murdered. But <laughs> Game of Thrones, who knows? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll stop that. But um, it, it did seem like a legitimately powerful and emotional moment. Like, it seemed like one of the few times that Cersei really opens up, with the exception of moments when she's with her brother. And not just the... Um, let's move on. <laughs> Moving on from there. My next favorite part of this episode... It really, and I, and I may sort of repeat myself a little bit later, but Arya and Nymeria, I believe is her name? Nymeria, the, um, uh, Arya's, Ar Ar Arya's dog. <laughs> I'm trying to remember names. Uh, her, uh, direwolf. Their little relationship is so good and so strong and adorable. And I... I, I just absolutely love it. You can tell that Arya legitimately loves this animal, and the people directing the dire wolves are, do a really good job because it seems like she also very much cares for Arya. Um, in addition to, um, I don't think I, oh no, no, wait, I did write something down a little bit later that I'll touch on, but the dire wolves are adorable and I love them. 
which makes what happens at the end of this episode really sad for me. But moving on from there, oh, um, this is sort of going through John's goodbyes, I guess you would say. Uh, John Snow's goodbyes as he's heading off to the wall. But when John gives Arya Needle, or what she names Needle, and uh, gives her her own sword, because everyone sees her as just like, she's a girl, she's supposed to be dainty, she's supposed to be ladylike, she's not supposed to be, you know, wanting to fight and be a warrior. But that's obviously who she is, and John recognizes that, and so that's why he gives her this sword of hers, which was, it's its just an amazing thing. I, I really, really like Jon Snow. I really like Arya so far, and yeah, I... <sighs> Something bad's probably gonna happen to both of them. I'll, I'll find out as I go along. <laughs> Moving on from there, my next favorite part of the episode is getting to see more of Ned and Robert's, the best way I could put it was their brotherhood. Like, they, they've obviously been very close friends. They've fought together. Um, they have their own little fraternity, I guess you would say. If I'm not sure I'm using that in the right way, but still it's like there's very much a kinship between the two of them. There, there is um, respect, there's trust, to a degree, I guess, when we reach the end of the episode. But getting to see their relationship and seeing them just cut up and have fun, I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, there was admittedly sort of a little segment where they're talking about uh, John's birth mother where Ned very much just, uh, you know, he, he closes up very quickly. So, I don't, I, I don't know, maybe it'll be revealed what exactly it is that sort of is like, you know, this sort of dark mark in their relationship, but overall, the brotherhood they have, the kinship they have, I really like and enjoy. But my next favorite part of this episode was the scene where the assassin comes to kill Bren. Bren? Bran? Whatever. And just that that entire scene is amazing. Well, first of all, <laughs> Lady Stark, you know, basically taking on this assassin, I mean, it, he's a trained killer. I don't know if she has any actual um, fighting experience or not, but she still puts her all into it, and, I mean, she puts her hands right on a blade to try and, you know, get this, well, first of all, get the man away from her son, and also keep him from killing her, so that's just, that scene right there was phenomenal, and then when Bran's dire wolf comes in and just slaughters the assassin, purely, a, <laughs> that, was, that was one of those scenes where I just, you know, gave a little air fist pump. It was just like, yes, that was awesome. Because, I, I mean, I don't know if we'll ever learn a name or anything like that of this particular assassin, but, um, you know, he served his purpose, and that was getting slaughtered in a most glorious way by a dire wolf. Oh, so, yeah, that entire scene was amazing to me. And uh, while on one hand I would like to see more like it, that probably means that people I like will die. So, hopefully not too much. <laughs> Moving on from there. Um, the fact that Cat... Or, I don't know whether to call her Cat or Lady Stark, but um, I'll, I'll refer to her as Cat because I always forget her actual name. Because um, I always forget to write it. Caitlin? Caitlin? Whatever it is, I'll call her Cat. Um, uh, it's what I call it's like she turns into like you know Inspector Cat. She goes ex um, investigating the area where Bran fell and finds you know this mysteriously clear spot. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Among all the dust in this tower, and finds that one of them is a blonde hair, very much like that of Cersei's. And I don't know what she might assume happened, but, uh, well, obviously she thinks that the Lannisters were, um, well, Cersei and Jaime Lannister was, uh, you know, responsible for it, but I don't, she probably doesn't suspect that, if you know what I mean. Of course you know what I mean. I'm sorry. I'm a child. <laughs> but yeah, just, uh, that, 
bit of investigation and then the gathering of people she trusts. Uh, her son, uh, other guy whose name I still can't remember, uh, Rob Stark's friend. Uh, just the gathering of that, I, I found it, you know, just it was just really empowering in a way that she's taking the matters into her own hands. Uh, that was really cool to me. Uh, moving on from there, my next favorite part of this episode, taking us back to the Dothraki and um, Daenerys and Drogo, because Call is his title, as I was told by people in the comments. Thank you very much for that. But, um, I believe her name is pronounced Eerie, I-R-R-I, Eerie, um, the servant of Daenerys that gives her advice. Good lord, Eerie. Good lord, girl. That's all I'm going to say about that. Moving <laughs> on, my next favorite part of the episode, you might be able to guess from that last one, is, uh, Daenerys and Drogo. And I think just the best way I can possibly sum this up is... Oh. My. Yes, I'm a pervert. I'm sorry. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> There's something wrong with me. My next favorite part of the episode... This is one that I did technically mark out, but I decided to keep it just so I could mention it. Originally, I was going to say The Hound who I believe is either the bodyguard or, like, head knight, maybe, of the Lannisters slash um, the Baratheons. Whatever. He's the guy with the screwed-up face and gets treated like trash. And I, at first I was going to say he was one of my favorite parts because it seemed like there was something very honorable underneath this like just very ugly and disfigured exterior that gets treated like trash particularly by Joffrey <laughs> um and maybe Jamie too I don't remember but then at the end when we find out that he took the butcher's son and dragged him around and murdered him he immediately lost favor with me so, I find him a very intriguing character. I'm interested to see what else he does. Probably a lot of murdering. But he's definitely not what I would consider one of my favorite parts of this episode now. So anyway, moving on from there. My next favorite part of the episode is the segment, and you know, speaking of the Butcher's Boy, <laughs> is when, uh, sa sa Oh no, I'm forgetting the uh, older daughter's name of the Starks. Uh, Sansa. Sansa, yes. Um, her and Joffrey go and find Ar uh, Arya play sword fighting with the Butcher's Boy and just having fun, and Joffrey acts like a little jerk. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, anyway, the segment that follows Arya hits Joffrey, Joffrey attacks Arya just trying to, like, swing wildly at her and probably kill her. And then Nymeria bites Joffrey. And, oh, th that was just another one of those segments where I was just like, oh, this is, this is glorious. Thank you so much for doing this. I love these little dire wolves. <sighs> Which, again, brings me to you know, one of the sadder parts of the episode. But that segment right there was just amazing and glorious but well to repeat myself what comes afterward is unfortunately I, I call it one of my favorite parts because of what it symbolizes in a particular character not the exact events but because uh, Arya gets Nymeria to run away um, they decide to that a, a dire wolf needs to be punished. So the sentence falls on to Lady Sansa's Sansa, yeah, Sansa's uh, dire wolf. Sadly, which uh, the lady did nothing, absolutely nothing, but sentenced to death. And rather than uh, it, in Ned's favor. 
rather than just having this loved animal killed off by a butcher, he elects to do it himself. And the, the, the reason, basically the reason that, my favorite part of it is Ned's honor. He upholds his honor. He, as much as he doesn't want it to happen, he knows that as the king's hand, or if he is the king's hand at this point, anyway, but potentially the king's hand, you know, he has to follow the wishes of the king, his friend, his, essentially, uh, his brother. So the sentence has to be carried out, but rather than just have it be done by some murderous thug, he wants it to be done by himself. As, uh, I'm probably very much paraphrasing here, but the dire wolf is of the north. It's his duty. So it's just like the way Ned upholds his honor, the way he, he's a very honorable man, perhaps to a fault, actually probably to a fault, but at the same time I can really respect what he does there. And then when it's all said and done, the end of the episode, we get the little slow pan to Bran and his eyes open up. So. What is going to happen now? That's probably a question I should save for the end of this episode. So yeah, that Bran waking up is my final favorite part of this episode. Now I know I had a long list here. I apologize for the length of it, but there's just uh, there was a lot to really enjoy about this episode, in my opinion. I do have some annoyances, however, and uh, the first of which is maybe it's just more of a me thing. But we're, since the first episode started with uh, an intro scene, essentially, and then we get the title, but then this episode just starts with the title, I, I miss that, I, I, I kind of call it the pre credit stinger, where we get just like the slightest bit, maybe, of a cliffhanger leading into the episode, or just an important event, something before the credits roll, the opening credits. And it didn't have that. So for me, that, that was just an annoyance because I do like those in shows. Um, I don't know if they'll mix it up, whether some episodes will or some won't. I'll just have to wait and see, I suppose. Um, but either way, it's, it's something I prefer, but if they stick with the just opening up with the credits from now on, fine. But moving on from there, my next annoyance with the episode... And it's I assume it'll be delved into more, but just... Cat's just pure hatred of Jon Snow. Now, I know why she doesn't like him. Uh, it's explained, you know, 17 years ago you went to war, then you came back with another woman's son. And, you know, I understand that, but at the same time, he's been there 17 years! You've had time to come to terms with that. He's been there. He has been there for your family, for your kids. Get over yourself. <laughs> but again, that's just me. So anyway, and the, the kid's already labeled a bastard for life, so what are you gonna do? Anyway, uh, just, uh, that's one, just one instance in which I really didn't care for Cat in this episode. Moving on, my next annoyance uh, was that Cat <sighs> makes such a big deal about Ned leaving and it not wanting him to go but unless I'm mistaken and if I am mistaken then you know I'll you know count this annoyance null but in the previous episode when she got the letter from her sister I believe it was her sister you know she's talking about how you know he he needs to be well, both him, her, uh, both Cat and Ned talk about how he needs to be the hand in order to protect the king, and it, it seemed like to me at the time that she was ready, like she was at that point, understanding why Ned should be the hand of the king. But then all of a sudden, and it's probably because of Bran, I admit, you know, Bran is in this coma for however long, which I'll get to that. And I just, I, it, it seems like she flip-flopped to me. 
and that might be inaccurate. Again, if I'm wrong there, please do correct me, but it's just, uh, it, it annoys me. But moving on, oh, uh, here we go. Time. The, uh, like the last episode, just the passage of time. There's no indication of it at all. Seemingly, from what I was watching, it's, it, it seemed like everything here took place over the course of maybe a couple of days. Maybe a couple of days, at the most. However, we get the line, I have prayed for more than a month. And that has occurred from the beginning to a certain point in this episode where it doesn't seem like a lot of time has transpired. So, I just, I don't know, maybe it's something I'll get used to more as I go on or I'll just learn to ignore it. But the passage of time in this show just it it comes and goes and it's like all of a sudden oh it's a it's a month later and uh we have no indication of this other than the fact that the dire wolves are a little bit bigger and uh someone says a month has passed or i've prayed for a month so there you go so yeah passage of time and then my final annoyance with this episode is joffrey and sansa dear god <gasps> want to throw up in my mouth I, uh, I really, really hope that I come to like Sansa. She, she had a moment at the end when she finds out Lady is going to die. She had a moment where I truly did empathize her with her for like the first time in the show so far. But the rest of it, it's just her, her and Joffrey, and I just again, it makes me want to gag. They. And it's not for bad acting. It's like maybe we're supposed to not like Sansa in the beginning here, but she's just, she gets, well, not her specifically, but her and Joffrey both just great on my nerves in a way that is just palpable. So yeah, so yeah, don't care for both of them right now. Keeping my fingers crossed for Sansa because she is a Stark and thus far she's the only one of the Starks I don't particularly care for. And then there's the youngest of the Starks that uh, I, I I guess I've still missed. I still haven't actually caught him in an episode. But Bran's youngest brother, or the, the youngest of the Starks, missed him again in this episode, but apparently he's a person. Anyway, <laughs> but kind of got off track there. But those are my favorites and my annoyances. As always, please do leave your own in the comments down below. I am definitely looking forward to, well, hearing your thoughts on my favorites and annoyances as well as some of your own. Let's have a discussion, shall we? But moving on from there, it is time for... Uh, not the track of the episode, because I, some people requested that I do keep track of the episode in. And I will if anything significant comes up, but really... Uh, it's still the intro credits for me, so I'm not really going to say that that's the track of the episode, because it's just the track of the show at this point. But moving on into my quotes, my favorite quotes of this episode, and we did get quite a few. Um, <laughs> and uh, I... Again, uh, well, I apologize as usual for the language, but, you know, the, because of this show, kind of hard to avoid. But Joffrey, and I will say, this is probably the one time in which I kind of like Joffrey because he made me laugh. But when Tyrion wakes up in the barn with all the dogs, Joffrey says, Better looking bitches than you're used to, uncle. That was a marvelously written, marvelously executed line. I absolutely loved that. And, uh, you know, and then after that, Tyrion proceeds to slap the crap out of Joffrey. So it's, it's, it's a great scene overall. It's a great segment of scenes of lighthearted violence toward family members. This is getting dark. <laughs> and, um,. Reference to Tyrion's holes, shall we say. But moving on from there, my next favorite quote, or the next quote of the episode, 
is one that just really, it, it, it got me right here when it was said by Ned. It, it said from Ned to Jon Snow before they separate, and Jon goes, starts heading toward the wall, and Ned heads with Robert down the King's Road. And it's simply this, you might not have my name, but you have my blood. And again, that just... For... I, 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 maybe it was because it came so soon after Cat just seemingly wanting to tear John's eyeballs out, and John always getting called a bastard by, you know, most people. But the respect he does get from Rob, from Arya, and from his father, it just, it, it was really touching, and that line just worked so well for me. So yeah, uh, hopefully we'll get a really good line from John soon, because it seems like two of my favorite quotes in the past two episodes have been from people talking to John. Uh, Tyrion last episode, and then Ned this time. My next quote of the episode... Ah, it comes from Tyrion, and it's oh, it's a glorious one, uh, and, and, and it's it, it's so it's such a good one too. This is one that if it, I, I'm sure it probably exists already, but I want on a bumper sticker or something. My brother has his sword, and I have my mind, and a mind needs books like a sword needs a whetstone. It's it's true, it's true, because like you know. Uh, uh, What's the phrase? Um, the mind is a is a horrible thing to waste. Paraphrasing, obviously, but you know you got to. If you don't exercise your mind, if you don't read, if you don't keep educating yourself in some way, your mind will just go to waste. So that's that's such a good quote, and it's it's another one of those. I feel like Tyrion's gonna be not fourth wall breaking, but he's going to like most things he says for me are probably going to reach far outside of. <laughs> this show and into real life. Now my final quote of the episode comes from Eerie. Eerie? Eerie? Whatever it is. And it's just quite simply when she's trying to, when she's teaching Daenerys um, some things for the, oh my. <laughs> I'm five. Um, Oh, uh, uh, Daenerys says, uh, uh, that's not the Dothraki way. It's like, you know, she doesn't want to get in trouble. She doesn't want to cause trouble. To which Eri says, if he, wanted, if he wanted the Dothraki way, why did he marry you? Which is an excellent point. I mean, you could say it's just kind of like he, he just wanted someone, but the quote itself and the way that... Drogo reacts later, um, does imply that there is a reason behind why he, or like, there's other reasons behind why he married her, even if maybe it was just subconscious for him. So yeah, I just, I really like that line. Uh, all of those quotes were really good. Um, obviously both of these episodes have had plenty of lines that were very quotable, so let me know um, some of yours in the comments down below, or on Twitter, or wherever you want to. It's an open world! Uh, I, don't, I don't know why I did that. <laughs> Moving on. Um, as for a theory for this episode, it's one that came from uh, the very quick scene with uh, Sarah jo Jorah Mormont, and it's when he's talking about the ghost grass and the just the myth uh, that the Dothraki believe. Um, it's my theory is basically this: is that there's some importance to this ghost grass, and that, in his words murders all other grass, and the Dothraki believe that that's how the world will end. It's a, it's a strange theory, but I feel like maybe there's either symbolism there for maybe what is coming up in the story, perhaps, um, and it's more of a metaphor, or maybe the ghost grass is connected to something. The, the White Walkers, or something along those lines. It's, it's hard to say. But again, just it's just a theory and a really far out there one that I'm making up uh, two episodes in. Anyway. Alright. Uh, 
before I get into my overall thoughts, I do have a what the f of the episode, and I really mentioned it earlier. It's when we see that the Hound has murdered the butcher's boy by dragging him behind a cart, and he just doesn't care. It's not the, one of the most extreme WTFs, obviously, but it just... I, I just remember feeling so mad when I saw that happen. It was just like, really? Why? He didn't do anything. And, ooh. Yeah. Just another reason for me to hate Joffrey. And now the Hound. But anyway, my overall thoughts on this episode. Um, you know, despite all the really good things I had to mention, um, it, it was kind of slow. It, it definitely had some moments that were really enjoyable, and again, it's like, it had me just very going, Arr, yes! But at the same time, there, uh, maybe, maybe it's because I'm also watching um, some other shows at the same time, so it's hard for me to measure it out, but for some reason this episode felt slower to me. It's like, you know, they're definitely laying out a lot of story, uh, building some things up, and probably said uh, setting some groundwork for what is to come. So for me, it just felt a bit slow, for the most part uneventful, but at the same time, I, there's nothing wrong with that really, uh, because you know, not every show is going to have just constant action, which admittedly I do enjoy. I'm looking forward to seeing some true action and not just people getting slaughtered or pushed out of windows. <laughs> but, yeah, I'm uh, just very much looking forward to more. It was a good episode overall, in my opinion. You know, there's nothing wrong with it at all. Just, um, again, kind of slow. So, those are all my thoughts on The King's Road. Please, again, everyone, let me know your thoughts on this episode down below. You know, your favorites, your annoyances, quotes, blah, blah, blah. If there was... A track of the episode that you can think of, uh, you know, link me to it on, to where I can hear it on the official soundtrack. Because again, for me, just the all the music works. It feels appropriate, but nothing really stands out besides the opening track. But that's just me. Um, but alright, everyone, thank you so much for joining me for the second episode of Discovering Game of Thrones. I hope you enjoyed it, and I will see you all next time for Lord Snow.